Stuart Klein and welcome to Off the Set. You are about to meet three pioneers. They are not in the same class of, say, Daniel Boone, but their job was harder than Boone's, for they did live television in the early days here at Channel 5. And we've invited them back for three reasons. First, this year marks the 40th anniversary of WNEW TV. Second, their work is now featured at the Museum of Broadcasting in a new summer long exhibit called Metro Media and the Dumont Legacy. And third, it's just a treat for me to talk to them. They are Fred Scott, a staff announcer at Channel 5 for 30 years, <laughs> who was also the commercial ranger on Captain Video, which Fred will explain shortly. Quiet, fellas. <laughs> The unique Sandy Becker, <coughs> the man Becker of a zillion <laughs> voices and characters who needed them because he was probably on the air more than any other human being. And the inimitable Soupy Sales, who, since I want to start this program on a high plane, will now greet you as White Fang. <laughs> Soupy, uh, what were the good parts and the bad parts about doing live television? Well, first, a salute like to guys like Fred and Sandy and to all the people who did uh, live shows in those days. Don't forget, in those days, you had to come up with five shows a week. And, and it only represented uh, your uh, future is if you had ratings enough and you beat the competition to stay on the air. Because if you didn't, they got somebody else. And don't forget, in those days, you didn't have, they didn't give you producers and writers. You did everything yourself. So when you saw Fred or Sandy or myself uh, in front of a show, or whether it was Chuck McCann or, or, or Fred Hall or any of the Sonny we did it, you did it yourself. Uh, you didn't have that help. There was no budget for those things. So every day you put your life on the line. Did, did you ever have any real disasters? No. Uh, uh, oh, disasters. <laughs> well, you always have disasters when you're doing live. Give me an example. <clears throat> well, I don't think as much as a disaster, as much as it's pretty funny. I remember one time when uh, Frank Nastasi was doing <clears throat> Pookie behind the window, and he used to lip sync records, and we had a, a floor director named Lenny, who was really little, at the, a little short. And Lenny Messina. Lenny, Lenny Messina, Messina. that's right. right. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> it, it, it comes to the end of the show. And don't forget now, when you're ad-libbing most of the shows, you have not gone in and timed them, so you really had to work on that balance of, of, of getting out on the half hour or the hour. And so Pookie was singing, so uh, I think Artie Farce, uh, or, or uh, one of the directors, said to Lenny, Arnie Knox, I think it was, did the show, said, tell uh, that after the number of fast goodbye, so what he, when they took a close up of Pookie singing, you know, something like that, he tells me off to the side, he says, it's a fast goodbye after the number. So I said, tell Frank. So I, I said, tell Pook, you know, because he was right. So they <clears throat> pulled the thing back, and Pookie was at the window, and Lenny was down in front of him going, <laughs> there'll be a, a fast goodbye after your number. Well, naturally, <laughs> Frank is doing the thing, jumping like that, see? And Lenny turns, he says, he's not paying any attention to me. <laughs> <laughs> let's show, let's <laughs> Let's show an excerpt of Vintage Soupy, and this is one of the clips uh, that you will see at the exhibit at the Museum of Broadcasting <laughs> if you want to drop by. It's classic Soupy. Hey, let's find out now uh, what the weather's going to be around the country, and all we have to do is turn on the old radio. Right, gang? Right! Uh, yeah. <laughs> a little hostile. Do you like southern fried lasagna? Do you have a hankering for food that will melt in your mouth? Then try our ice cream. Well, you're in for it at the new restaurant everyone is raving about. Do you like sweet and sour, sweet and sour? Are you crazy about egg rolls parmesan? Then you love the new Chinese Italian restaurant, Chan Luigi's. <laughs> This morning, you were on my mind, and you were on my mind. I got to run, I got to worry, so I got to run. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll get back to Supi, especially about pies in the face. Let's move on to Sandy, who I think at the height of your career at Channel 5, Sandy, I don't know how many hours you were on the air in one day. I don't know how many hours. Tell me. Well, actually, I had the morning show, which was on from 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock until 9 in the morning, 9.30. And then I had the evening show, which was an hour. So that was, and then I had a show on Friday night, which we called the Bugs Bunny show. And uh, we did, we started the Wonderama show. Remember that one? That was yeah. the, originally, Saturday, that was a six-hour show Sunday from 12 until 6. You were the host <coughs> of a six-hour live television. Six <laughs> hours live. It, well, it was done much in the, the, the way that the old Dave Garraway show was done. I mean, the cameras would move in front of each other and the cables and the rest and had a nice, really relaxed kind of atmosphere. And they had everything. It was very eclectic. It had, uh, we had puppet shows. We had uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. As a matter of fact, that's when I discovered Chuck McCann. So he was a puppeteer on that, that particular <coughs> show. And uh, then we'd have interviews, and then we'd have, you know, uh, uh, Girl Scouts singing, and, and then we'd have little clips and news and just about everything. But it was a six-hour show. And it was, it was exhausting, but we really accomplished a great deal. It was really interesting. What was it was your, all improvised, entirely extemporaneous. What was your budget on that show, Sammy? <laughs> <laughs> One of those big zeros. <laughs> they, uh, they didn't spend a lot of money. Oh, yeah. yeah I can that's remember. why you had to ask well, the parents. No, I remember. That's right. No, I didn't do that. I never asked them. What, what happened, you'd write a bit in those days for, you know, you want to use a dog. And it, well, you know, you, you had to, well, you had your own dog. Finally, I got used my own dog because in those days they would get two hundred fifty dollars for a dog. You'd go out and steal one and have them do the bit and take them out, you know, back again. I you wish I'd known that. I had, a, I had Shotzi. I could have made them. I could have made more with my dog. Than I <laughs> Doing all those shows, Sandy, uh, you created a million voices, it seems, and a zillion different characters. And we have a clip of uh, one of your classics, Hambone. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about that after we see it, and you can tell us about the derivation of Hambo. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hambo! <laughs> Original contact lenses, man. I can, I can contact the moon, Mars. <laughs> How did that character come about? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, actually, the song Hambone is an old, right. very old song. And I used to get records in Harlem in a little place, I don't know if it exists anymore, Bobby's Record Shop. And when I heard Hambone, and it was, was this Hambone, and I thought, and I was doing this show, and I thought, there must be something that I can do with that it, it, and conjured up somebody who was outlandish in, a, in some kind of a crazy garb and I could think of a <clears> pith <throat> helmet and a feather and then I finally put them together with the crazy eyes and then at that time uh, the program director was a little conservative and he said well what does it mean I mean what's a guy in a pith helmet and a crazy you know a lion tamer suit and I said I don't know but I just have a feeling that it's gonna it's gonna work with the rhythm and with the music this is one of the advantages, as Supi can confirm, that we had. We, you had gut feelings. Nobody put it through a computer, you know, and you took your chances, and as we did, and we went along with those things. And the same uh, it applies to all the characters that I did. You just, you felt something. You thought it was going to be funny. Because I think the secret is that we have enough of, of the child in us <laughs> so that we would like to see that kind of thing, and we go along with that. I think, essentially, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. I remember when I first started here in uh, in in '64 in September, uh, they called me in the office and they said we don't want you throwing any pies it, it, it for the first month. And I said why? And they said well we just want to stay away from that. And I said well that's going to really work, you know. And then another time they called and they said the dog is grunting too much. 
<laughs> and I says, who's saying that? And he said, the salesman. I said, well, they're drinking too much. Goes, who cares what they say? It's the people, you know. And, and you know, but you, what Sandy said is true. Uh, that's what m much of television was like in, in those days of the 50s and 60s. Even the management went on a gut reaction. You didn't have those test markets and preview houses. Well, I guess you didn't have time. You had so much material to get out to get on the air. It was a deadline. I, you had to meet that every day. I, I'm just overwhelmed at how you managed. You, Sandy, for instance, you said you did a 90-minute show in the morning, an hour show in the morning, 90 at night. Uh, you did something in the afternoon and a six-hour show on Sundays. On Sunday. Wonder, the original Wonder Woman. How did you cope with all of that? In retrospect, I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know how, but you know, the thing that's so marvelous about it, because we didn't have any constraints. We had carte blanche. Once you establish yourself as a talent and they recognize that you must have something going for you, they just turned you loose and the things just came out. It, it, it had to, you couldn't script all this stuff. It was impossible. When I did the puppets, I'd put those little puppets up there and it was just as if they were thinking for themselves. It, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. And I, I just wanted to point something out. Uh, we were, Soupy was talking about how, you know, you have to wing things and you take lots of chances. Oddly enough, uh, and I, I'm sure the audience knows and you know, that the shows that right now are getting the big ratings are the shows that are, that, that are revealing how people goofed as we would yes, right. every the day. Shows. People are fascinated by that. So, and we did a lot of goofing, I know. I mean, the camera wasn't in the right place. And I think I remember, Ted, uh, Fred, you should tell him about that thing that you did the, the candy bar commercial. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was Let's get to that. Fred. Uh, as a matter of oh, fact, you, you, okay. <laughs> Fred, in uh, terms of seniority, is the class elder here. Fred, <laughs> how far do you go back to Channel 5? Well, I, I was in experimental television before I came to Channel 5, uh, W2XJT, uh, for two years. And then Channel 5 went on the air with their daytime programming. Uh, in 1948, September 48. And you were there? I came, I came at that time, yes. So you literally put Channel 5 on the air? As far as the daytime regular program, yes. They were on the air prior to that with uh, Yankee baseball and Dennis James, OK wrestling. Mother, wrestling show yeah. and that kind of stuff. But as far as regular programming is concerned, 48 was the year. Yeah. Now, as we said in our intro, <clears throat> not only were you a staff announcer for 30 years, but you were the commercial ranger on Captain Video, and Sandy just mentioned about hustling candy bars on a Captain Video <laughs> this is the outer space show. Tell me about stories. it. Well, uh, yes, I used to do uh, the candy bar commercials uh, on the Captain Video and the peanut butter commercials and all the other general food stuff. But I think what Sandy's referring to is a, uh, a movie show I used to do on Saturday nights called Dick Tracy. And the routine, Stu, we would uh, show up to the studio and we'd... Uh, go on the air live, put the uh, show on the air, and then go over and get a drink of water and sit down and relax and rehearse the first commercial. Week after week after week, that was our routine. One night I came in and uh, they didn't tell me that they're gonna move the first commercial up to right after the opening, within a minute. So this particular night they opened the show live and a minute later they give me a standby to, to do my first commercial. So I thought it was a rehearsal and I treated it as such. So I, I, they said, stand by for the first commercial. And I said, I don't have the product. And the, and the floor manager said, that's, that's props. I said, okay, forget it. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll fake it for the cameraman. So I get a cue and I start talking. And I get to the end. I said, I pick up nothing and I point to it. I said, next time you're at your supermarket, look for this cellophane bag of two cent chunkies. And I was in, they went to black. And everybody's standing around looking at me with their mouth open. I said, what's the matter with you guys? That was on the air. You're crazy. I said, hey, David, was that on the air? And the PA system comes back, yes, it was. <laughs> now, I wasn't concerned about what I had done, but what I might have done. You know, <laughs> oh, you do rehearsals. And you know, clown around. You know, you say all kinds of things, and you, and you make all kinds of remarks. I got by that, thank God. Now, let's, let's bring back the magic days of an outer space show live from, I think, this <laughs> studio here at Channel That's right, 5. right here. And this Wanamakers, was, who started at Wanamakers. That's this was the classic... Rangers, Rogers oh. here. Well, because of cosmic interference, Rangers, I haven't been able to get through to the galaxy. But, uh, you know, she was supposed to land here a long time ago. And, well, Rangers, I don't have to tell you, we're, we're quite concerned about her. So, Rangers, while we're waiting for her to come in, why do you say we check on our Texas agents, Wakely and White, and see what kind of an alibi Jane Morgan has for them? Rangers, stand by for... Texas. 
Marked his record file number MRB-310. Come in, please. Sharp focus. Sharp focus. Can I ask you a simple question, Fred? Yes. Yeah, sure. What the hell was that all about? <laughs> okay, that was uh, to fill uh, the fill six minutes of the show, so that the writer didn't have to write a, a, a thirty-minute show every day. Okay, so we would go to these old Western films, and the, and the star of the Western films was supposed to be an agent of Captain Videos, and it was tied in script-wise and so forth. Let me tell you a funny story about that. I would do this every day on the show. My son, Freddie Scott Jr., was born on uh, June fourth. 1950. And uh, so that night I said, uh, on the, going into the Western film, I said, well, mark this record file number FESJR 5.41950. Boom, we go in. That was his name, his weight, and his year. Okay? I was sending a message to my folks out in Ohio that the baby was born, he was named after me, and how much he weighed. And every day I would update his weight 5.6, 5.7, so forth. FCC didn't like that. You got five years. <laughs> yeah, you got five years. <laughs> we are going to pursue such subtle topics as pie throwing and other matters of interest after this break. I'd like to ask three of you, all of you, what do you think of kids' programming on television today? Well, they're really, you can't really call it children's program. When we did shows, uh, we were role models for a lot of kids. And it's great to see your kids have grown up and they're teenagers and they're adults with their own kids today. I think what happened with, uh, with Fred Scott and Sandy and myself and uh, all the others, kids really looked up to you, they watched the show, and you could get messages across in your own way of, like, be careful when you're across the street, don't talk to strangers, do what your mom and dad tell you to do, things like that. Uh, the, 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 the kid shows of the present and been for the few years, just cartoons. Uh, the parents don't watch them with the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very violent, very noisy. Uh, there's nothing really creative, but after all, you don't have to pay residuals to Porky Pig and Bugs Bunny. As a matter of fact, I think, Sandy, uh, when you were doing Wonderama, uh, there were just as many adults watching that program as kids. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, the, the point I wanted to make, and it, it substantiates what uh, Soupy said, uh, much of the fair on television now, the so-called adult programming, is watched by <clears throat> the children. That's their programming, essentially, now. And the Saturday morning stuff, for the most part, is really all cartoons. And what we used to do is we had a, we had a, a contact, a communication that existed between the kid at home and ourselves. It was a very intimate, beautiful thing that existed. And in retrospect, when I think of what an awesome responsibility yeah. that was you know i think my goodness because you you see people now who are you know in their late 20s or 30s and we watched you and we, we really enjoyed it and you they did look up to you but they loved you because they wouldn't watch you unless they tra children are very perceptive i don't think many people realize that today and if they didn't like you you know they go somewhere they watch the cartoons they didn't care about the person in but Soupy was adored, and I, today, when a, a gray-haired cop comes up to me, <laughs> so I used to watch you on TV. Yeah. Okay, but but it's, with, it's with such love, and it's a, it, it is something that will yeah. never happen again. Did they look up to you, Fred? I don't know if they looked up to me or not, but I know that uh, many times, uh, I'm, I'm amazed. Yeah, I'm, well, <laughs> many times uh, in my real estate business today, the people will be sitting across the desk from me, and I'm talking about homes and real estate and so forth, and young person, uh, 30, 32, 33, and, and they're not listening to a word I'm saying. They say, I've got to stop you. You're in our past someplace. You've got to find out who are you, you know, and, and, and then I tell them and so forth. But one of the incidents, too, I think is... Uh, this sort of, uh, I think, depicts the, the type of uh, contact, communication we had with our kids. 
I was at the Palisades Amusement Park one day on a Saturday morning at a personal appearance. Long line of kids, and that's one little boy about five years old comes along in the line. I go down to my knee and I said, hi there, Sonny, how are you? And he looked at me and the tears started coming down his cheeks. He says, you know me, Uncle Fred, I watch you every day. He started to cry. Here I am, I'm his best friend. I don't even know his name. We had that kind of contact with the kids doesn't exist anymore. I was doing appearance. Uh, I think uh, when you're doing television shows and you're working every day, you, you're not out into the public that much to realize yeah. how well you're doing and That's how right. much you are liked, wow. you know, and loved. And I was doing appearance at Klein's in Yonkers, and I never forget it was a riot that day, and they were chasing me, and I fell, and they were grabbing at me, and one guy, one kid was hitting me with a cardboard cylinder on the head, and I looked up, and I says, why are you doing that? And he says, I just want to touch you. <laughs> Sandy, we got a couple of seconds in the, before we go to the next break. I want, to give, I want you to give me as many voices as you can. Oh. Kiba, kiba. <laughs> Well, Kiva Kiva has a little voice that's a little... It's, I'm not sure whether he is from Wursthofen or Bavaria. <laughs> Give me another those voice. Places. Another voice. Norton Nork. That was Panama. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Norton Nork was, a, that was... That was something I used to love to do. It was a, kind of a Marcel... Marceau kind of thing. I, I was, that was a, The other voice, let's see. All right, the Kailastima. And the only one who ever won... The prize on his show was his mother. His mama always win. <laughs> and then there was uh, the, big, the big professor. Well, uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> that question is uh, uh, somewhat imponderable, but we will give him a prize if you insist. <laughs> and, uh, Soupy, Black Fang. Uh -huh. It's Black too. Uh -huh. Black Fang with ooh here, ooh here. <laughs> <laughs> How long can you guys keep this up? I mean, wasn't there a point at a... a yeah, we were all fired. Yeah. <laughs> we all fired. Yeah. Does that happen? Where did you find No, no, no. No, actually, I think our, our, our budgets outdistanced our, you know, uh, they, they equated it in terms of the there's, bottom line. There's yes. a lot of that still going around. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we'll be back in a minute. <laughs> We only have 90 seconds left, and I never even got the Soupy's trademark pie in the face. But in the short time remaining, I'd like each of you to tell me in 20 or 25 seconds, if you can, <coughs> your feelings about being a pioneer in live television. Wait, you want to start with Soupy? Well, of course, to me, it was like going to school every day. You learned. I, I, I might never, I, I, I didn't get along too well with management while I was here. I got along better with them, at, you know, in the new management. But I'll tell you one thing, <coughs> the engineers and the stagehands here at NEW were the best I've ever worked with in Amen. my life. And I've been in the business 38 years. And it was a pleasure. And you look forward to going into work every day. And everybody had that great excitement. And that was to put on the best show and to have a great time doing it. And it really is, that's, that's my feeling. Sandy? I, I must say that uh, I have never had or never will again have an experience, the kind of experiences I had here. And what I think uh, Soupy was alluding to was like a, it was familial. Uh, the, the John Scott, who was an engineer who, who died recently, and right. one, one guy who could break, I just have to look at that face of his and, you know, with a deadpan. I loved them all. Uh, Eddie <clears throat> Corrigan, who was a, a stagehand, these people all worked with you and they enjoyed it. And it was, I look forward to, to being here yeah. and doing that show. The Frank Keynes and the Ralph Spinardis. Right. John, John Scott did it to me on the news live many times. Fred? <laughs> well, I, I agree with both uh, Sandy and Subi that the, 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 the feeling we had of family here at Channel 5 over all the years is really great. And another thing, I felt like I was in summer stock in the early days, 48, 49, 50, because you were doing everything live for the first time. You're doing everything, going from one set to the other, back and forth. I would work eight shows a day. 14 network shows a week. Fun, live, and exciting. You don't have it anymore. <laughs> well, you're still part of the family, and it's been a treat for Thank me you. to welcome you back. This is Stuart Klein. Thank you for joining us.